Tony here. If you've been enjoying One Step Beyond, and especially if you enjoy the fact we don't have ads running through it, please consider dropping something in the tip jar. Think of when you encounter a busker. You like what you hear, you put some loose change in the hat, and you go about your day knowing that you're doing your own little part to encourage creativity. Just look for the Support This Show link on whatever app you're using to listen along, or visit supporter.acast.com forward slash one step beyond. Thank you. And now, on with the show. Hey, you! And welcome to what is already episode 27 of One Step Beyond, a show about positively engaging with the world outside our door. I'm Tony Fletcher, and today I have great pleasure of sharing a conversation with a very old friend who, until about six months ago, I had not spoken to for a solid 25 years. And if that seems like a contradiction in terms, well, it's not, as we'll reference in just a moment. An awful lot has happened to the two of us in that quarter century, and an awful lot of that, including the awfulness, but also a positive engagement with those negatives, has happened or befell my guest, whose name is Mike Peters. And if that name seems familiar to some of you, well, it might be because of this... And this. Give me love. And this. And a whole lot of other music besides. Almost all of which carries the name of Mike's band, The Alarm. You know, One Step Beyond is a year old now. And I made a point early on with the show that I wanted to feature everyday people who've been making a difference in their own lives. And hopefully to the lives of other people around them in the process. But having said that. I've made something of a career, like literally, genuinely, it's been my income, interviewing more well-known people for the books I've written, for TV shows and magazine stories. So it's something I'm comfortable with. And of course, the more well-known people can also step outside their comfort zones. They can positively engage with the world outside their door. And they often have the pedestal, you know, the platform to make a significant difference in other people's lives too. So... This episode may be the first time featuring someone who has a considerable public profile, but it's probably not going to be the last time as we move into and on with our second year. The conversation I had with Mike was conducted over Zoom, as so many of them are these days. He was in his home in North Wales. I was in my home in New York State. And we talked for well over an hour. And all of it felt really, really good. Like I could have used all of it but I have still edited it for length. I genuinely never personally get through podcasts where they have interviews that run more than an hour. And even if my show occasionally has to run over the 60 minute mark, I don't want the interviews to do likewise. Still, I am considering that we may well put the unedited video interview up on YouTube in a few days or a week or so. So keep an eye on the social media. You're going to hear the occasional ping in the background while Mike is talking. I guess he's so positively proactive and possibly popular with it that even when he thought he turned off his incoming email, he was still getting messaged and zapped via other means and apps. But hey, that's the modern world, baby. One other thing to note, Mike is such a professional. He's been doing interviews like this for decades that there was really very little need for me to clarify or interject here, which may well come as a relief to those of you who prefer unexpurgated talks. And just so that you're fully aware and don't feel misled, the interview that follows is not about Mike's music per se. It's about his life journey on the personal health issue side and the incredible work he's subsequently been able to do based on his personal contacts, his public profile and his truly indefatigable energy, even in the face of adversity. I'm really excited to present it. I encourage you all to listen to Mike's music from his early recordings with The Alarm, which mean quite a lot to me, to his brand new album Raw, which he recorded in the immediate aftermath of the January 6th attack on the US state capitol. I invite you to watch the films and videos referenced in the following interview, and I will, of course, provide all necessary links in the show notes. Those are the written words that you can find on your phone or wherever else you're listening to this interview, unless it's on the radio, in which case keep your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel. Unless, of course, you're listening to the radio at home, in which case that would probably seem rather stupid. So I'd like to invite you to sit back, but not before confirming you've had or have booked an annual checkup with your doctor. 
I'd like to encourage everyone in the States to keep pushing for health care reform, because for everyone else who lives in a country with socialized health care, they will tell you that that is a good thing and that health care should be a human right, not a privilege. And with that, strap in and prepare to take a breathless journey with Mike Peters as we go. One step beyond. Can you introduce yourself in terms of what your profession is? Uh, my profession is a, is a musician and, and a host of other activities that get added onto the, the tag of being a musician. I'm the organiser, the events manager, the creator, songwriter, mus- and uh, general all-round dog's body for everything to do with the alarm. And I'm also um, the co-founder of our charity, Love, Hope, Strength Foundation. And it's the latter that we're mainly going to talk about today. But... I am going to let listeners know that you and I go back a long, long, long way. And I was working it out and it's actually 40 years. It would have been probably 1981 that if I remember correctly, this is how things work back in the day. You just got my phone number, I believe, and rang me up and said, uh, I've got a band. That's right. Yeah, we'd seen the jamming fanzine and we got the number and we called you up and we told you about our single Unsafe Building, which we were trying to get some attention for. And you gladly... um, let us come up and give you a copy in the office. And in the early 80s, you and I were, were pretty close early into the mid 80s. We were pretty close. We had a really, really strong relationship. We were friends. We played football together. Um, my band opened for the alarm at the marquee at least once. I got flown out to Los Angeles for your Spirit of 76 concert in what I think was April 1986 at uh, the free, big free concert, 25,000 people. Yeah, that was at UCLA in California, April the 12th, 1986, Spirit of 86 concert, yeah, going out live on the, around the world on MTV. I figured I figured you'd know the date of it. And that was my very first trip to America. I got to stay at the Hollywood Roosevelt with you. I posted re- not too long ago a hilarious picture of me in my Speedos at the uh, poolside. <laughs> you were looking much more, uh, much more rock star-like and much more buff <laughs> in your swimming shorts, because I think you realize the Americans wear swimming shorts and not, uh, and not Speedos uh, when they're lounging pool side i'm not so shameless that i won't repost those pictures so keep an eye on the social media and that first trip to the united states you know i had a wonderful time in los angeles didn't necessarily think i wanted to live there but on the way back home i made a one-day stop off in new york city and utterly fell in love with that place really did decide that uh, my future lay there and so in his own way inadvertently subconsciously maybe mike had something to do with me living in the states this last 30 plus years that came with a lot of rewards but at the same time unfortunately after that somewhere yeah, you know, we just fell out of touch as happens probably partly i moved moved to the states I mean, it's not like you weren't in new york a number of times you know it's nothing deliberate on either person's part you grow up you have kids other things happen which again is part of what we're going to talk about and we got back in touch this last six months because i'm putting together a compilation book of um the old magazine and we put together a very haphazard zoom call because we were both really busy and i just felt like this was one of these friendships that you just pick up after 30 years and it's like hey how are you doing that's it Tony. i think you know we're, we're when we both hit that point where you know you stop being with jamming you moved to america i i wasn't sort of in the alarm in the same way during the 90s and trying to bring up a family and raise kids and and do all the things that you've got to do and they, they become your priorities and and it's not so much about your mates that you're playing football with but you always have that bond and and it can pick up at any time and you carry on like it was yesterday and i think that's we've got one of those friendships you have an mbe after your name nowadays which is the same thing the beatles got except that yours is uh, i think theirs was something about for services to the entertainment industry what is your mbe for because that's no small achievement no, my MBB was uh, gifted to me or granted to me on behalf of our charity, Love, Hope, Strength. And it's for the work I've done in the in the field of uh, cancer and raising awareness and creating funds for people less fortunate than myself who have been diagnosed with cancer, but don't have access to the same treatment and nurses and medical teams that I have here in, in Wales, where I live in the UK. And it's free on the NHS, National Health Service, very lucky to live here and... Uh, yeah, so it's it's really for uh, all the work we've done with Love, Hope, Strength, which started in 2007. What year did you get the MBE? 
Uh, it was in 2017, in, in the January of 2017, uh, 2018, sorry, January 2018. Right. So it's, it's pretty recent. But I want to go back and um, talk about the story that your personal story that got you to start that charity. And um, I'm going to invite you to I mean, I'm basically going to invite you to tell it. You gave just the briefest of backgrounds there. But what has been your own story with cancer that led you to start this Love, Hope, Strength? Well, like everybody else, you know, cancer is not something you think about every day and you, you think it happens to other people. You think it happens to older people when you're young. And, and I was no different. And, and then in 1995, I was diagnosed with um, a disease uh, and that I was, well, I was basically sent to hospital because I had a lump in my collarbone and um, I was about to go on an American tour. And, and they, the doctor sent me some blood tests. And at, at that time in North Wales, there was no cancer center. So I had no idea. I think the doctor knew what was coming, but I had no idea. So I, I went up there with Jules, my wife, and my brother, Steve. He was in the car waiting to take me to a gig in the northeast of England. And I said, I'll be five minutes. I'll just do a quick blood test. And when I went to the hospital, the uh, nursing staff said, if you don't mind waiting a couple of minutes, the doctor would like to see you when he's read the results quickly. And I, again, no warning signs there. And, and as soon as I went into the office to, be, uh, to meet the doctor, I sat down and he handed me a sheet of paper across his desk and it said, let's talk about cancer. And at that point, my mind just went blank and I saw the word cancer, all the fear, the cold sweat came into your body, all the shock. And I don't really remember any more of what he said in that meeting other than come back tomorrow when you've got over the shock and let's talk about this properly and and work our way through this situation. And uh, I, I remember coming out of my shock in, at home. I went, got home somehow. My brother took me home and Jules, and, and he picked up the phone. And, and I was like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm cancelling the gig. And I was like, no way. I said, I can't. You can't cancel a gig. I said, I can't sit here all night thinking about what the doctor's going to tell me. Let's stay occupied. Let's keep moving. That really set a, created a mindset that, that sort of helped me get through what happened following when the next day I was, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and um, I was told I ha would have to have a bone marrow transplant to save my life. I, I had a young doctor who knew all the best treatments that were happening at the time and he, he wanted me to um, go for a cure and he said he could hit me with a very heavy hammer that would you know, affect my life but I would be uh, uh, able to live. So and just to just to put this in perspective, if I'm doing the math correctly, you're 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 barely a couple of years older than me. 1995, you'd have been in your early 30s. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and great. when you say you you always think cancer is going to happen to somebody else, I mean we do know young people get cancer, teenagers, young people, kids. But again, we think it's going to be some somebody else, and we're also as men we're taught to check for prostate, and there are dis different things that can affect you with age, but you don't think that in your early 30s, what really is meant to be prime of life, just when you may be thinking of starting a family, and you, everything seems to be peaking, that, that's not when you expect to be presented with a challenge like that, right? No, not, not for a second, I had no idea. When, when I went to the hospital, I, I, I thought I was, they were going to tell me I was working too hard, and I need to slow down a little bit, not not that I was going to have to have a bone marrow transplant, and uh, and 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 in in the when they sat me down, they and they told me what, what the reality of what was going to happen. I think I think there's a little bit of fear set in, and um, I think I decided I, I should run away <laughs> with the rock and roll band and and put this off. And and because I said to me, it's fantastic you want to go for a cure, but I said I, I'm I'm supposed to be on an American tour tomorrow on a on a plane. And I said, I, if I cancel it all, it will bring down this huge wave of negativity. There'll be promoters will have to refund tickets. Fans will be upset. Everyone won't know what the outcome is going to be. It's going to be the work that will fall on our shoulders because we, we look after ourselves and represent ourselves in, in, in terms of business as well as music. It would just be a, a catastrophic amount of work to deal with. And I said, if we're going to do this, I have to be right mentally. I have to be. So I said, look, give me three months. I'm not going to die in three months. I'm going to see out the diary. I'm going to prepare myself mentally for whatever's going to happen. And when I come back to you, I'm going to be ready for the fight of my life. And that's that. And they, there was a lot of arguing, and but they eventually let me go. And uh, and it was there that really things changed. That uh, you you remember Ian Wilson, our old uh, alarm manager, was our friend. 
I remember Ian very, very well. And I was watching the documentary you kindly sent me and I saw him uh, in the flesh on that documentary for the first time in years. He also used to play football with us. Yeah, he did. Yeah, absolutely. And Ian, like you, uh, Ian and I have always remained friends throughout. And um, and, and it was in that moment that uh, I was about to get on the plane and, and I told Ian, he was one of the few people I told because because I was going against the doctor's advice. I didn't even tell my mum what was happening because I thought, if my mum found out I, I had a cancer diagnosis and I was going to America, she'd kill me. And my mum was far more scary than cancer, believe me, when she wanted to be. And um, and I told Ian because he was helping me out with my career moves and things like that. And and Ian said to me, look, Mike, you, you know me well enough, but you don't know that when I've got friends in need, I, I like to put them in touch with a faith healer. And that's what he did. Ian put me in touch with a faith healer called Bambi from the airport. And I spoke to her on the phone. And she asked me some questions and she said, Mike, all the time I'm talking to you, I'm seeing the colour green. And I think that could be a healing colour for you to focus on while you're adrift from the medical treatment and, and waiting for whatever is going to happen when the, the medicine starts to kick in. And I told Ian this and he jokingly said, get yourself a, G, a green sweater when you get to America, it's going to be cold. And uh, on the plane, I was, I was, uh, I was turning it over in my mind and, uh, and I, and Ian liked John Lennon. I always had that image of John Lennon in a camo jacket. And, and I sort of thought, I, I'm going to go to war. This is going to be at my psychological combat zone right now. And I'm going to get off the plane. I bought, went and bought combat fatigues all in green. I wore them. I put them on. And I came out of the, the dressing room with them. And I said, right, Jules. I said to Jules, these aren't coming off till I'm cured. And this is the way we're going to live our lives till, till we get the, the green light to move ahead. But I'm not going to let this beat me. Right. And I, and I should say uh, you're wearing the camo jacket right now. I, I'm, I'm trusting it's not the same one, though. I, I do have some clothes that are that old, so maybe, maybe it is. <laughs> but, um, it is. But the fact that you're still wear, you know, wearing the jacket sort of indicates that cancer is a lifelong battle, right? I mean, fighting cancer is it's not like I'm going to use a football metaphor. It's not like you win the cup final, you get the trophy and that's it. You put it in the cupboard, you know, and it's all it's all over. Correct. Well, I think everybody who's had a cancer diagnosis lives with the fear for the rest of their lives that it might come back, even if it is a disease that is curable via surgery and can actually be cut out. There's always that fear in the mind that some of it has been left behind because it's such a silent killer. It's, it's um, a devilish disease. It only needs one cell to mutate into a life threatening situation. And so it never leaves you. And, and with myself, I was diagnosed. With, uh, originally with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and then re-diagnosed with, with leukemia in 2005, 10 years later. Jesus. And I was always told I had a chronic disease that would never leave me. Uh, but the, the doctors could, uh, some, uh, in 2005, they could at least reassure me that I would die with this disease rather than of it, which was, uh, you know, I took a lot of comfort from that and realised that if I stayed on top of my life and, and looked after myself, stayed running, stayed fit to give myself the best fighting chance then I could have lived the normal life expectancy I could possibly hope for but obviously there had to be sacrifices along the way but and I was always um of the mindset that the stronger I could be mentally the better the treatments would work for me and and the better the chance they would have of of doing what they're supposed to do and staying on top of the cancer yeah non non hodgkin's lymphoma for the, for those of us who've been lucky enough not to have this enter our lives that is a form of cancer is it a byword for a particular cancer can you just elaborate it, it, it's a it's a cancer of the lymph glands really the blood and it's um it, non hodgkin's lymphoma is is very similar to leukemia they're in the same family really but when i was diagnosed in 1995 um they didn't really have the knowledge they have today about the leukemias and the, and the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas um, like they do. So when originally when I was diagnosed, I probably actually had leukemia, but they couldn't quite tell at that time. And I, my doctor, Ed, Dr. Edwards, who's my hematologist, who's always been with me since that very day in 1995, he, he always says to me, the best thing you ever did of your own accord was go on that tour because we would have hit you with a seriously heavy hammer at that point and we'd have changed the course of your life and that was the knowledge we had we had to act on the knowledge but the fact i went on the tour bought a camo jacket went to war when i returned from the tour my blood count had gone in the opposite direction 
and it allowed the, the doctors the chance to realize something strange was going on and I possibly didn't have the normal disease like they possibly thought. So they didn't progress with the treatment. They put me into a situation called watch and wait where they could just keep a close eye on me. And then 10 years later, I was then re-diagnosed once they, they'd worked things out that I actually had a, a disease called leukemia that which they, knew, they then knew about which they didn't know about in 1995. And I was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But they're very, the, the, the difference between the two diseases is like looking at wallpaper of the same pattern on the wall. And one of the patterns is ever so slightly out from the rest. You can't detect it without some serious uh, science. And so I was, I was um, re-diagnosed in, with leukemia in 2005 and, and then it was, uh, I was sort of um, been able to manage it ever since. I've come very close along the way to falling off the edge and going over the, um, over the cliff with it. Uh, I, I, I've been lucky and I, I put this down to a bit of lifestyle practice and, and staying strong mentally and having music to um, deflect some of the darker passages you have to go through when you, when you think about having cancer in your own um, ecosystem in your body. And, and um, I, 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 w- I was able to survive on a drug for eight years that most people could only take for two years. And, uh, and that was a, a, a drug called um, rituximab. And, and I would ha- it was more of a maintenance treatment to stop the, the, the white blood growing in your body that's, that was rebellious. Right. And, uh, and a lot of friends that I, had, that I met in hospital having the treatment, it, they eventually gave up on that drug and they had to go on to other treatments and they weren't able to survive as long as I have. So I've been very lucky. So a couple of things are, are coming to mind here. So back in 95, you, by, by going off on tour, you put off the bone marrow transplant and then ultimately didn't need it. Would that be correct? It's correct. Yeah. I, I've been um, harvested for, for a future blood transplant. My brother has since been found to be a match. Should, should I need a transplant? You know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask something, uh, you know, incredibly basic, but, but that's because of so many people who don't have to go through this. Is it, uh, it, is it fair to say that leukemia is a form of cancer? Yeah, it's an absolute, it, you know, it's a proper cancer. When, when it's a cancer of the blood cell, cells, really, bloodstream, that's really what's different. Well, my wife, Jules, has had breast cancer and that required surgery and radiotherapy, whereas my treatment is all chemotherapy led, it's all drug um, rehabilitation led. And so I've, I've, apart from having to um, go through a transplant, luckily I haven't had to do that. That's really where leukemia gets dangerous for people. Uh, it is a dangerous disease in itself. It, untreated, it will kill everybody. But you know, in the, in we we grew up in the era of Ian Botham, the cricketer, who was Beefy Botham, the legendary England uh, yeah. and Wales cricket board <laughs> legend, and, and and he used to walk the length and breadth of Britain to raise money to fight leukemia in the in the seventies and eighties. I forgot about that. He did, didn't he? He yeah. did. He and and it was it was a fairly unknown thing then. People didn't really know what it was what leukemia was then and, and when he was walking originally the the odds were that you had uh, um uh, an 85 percent chance of losing your life if you got leukemia now in uh, all this time later 30 40 years later the odds have reversed completely and now you've got an 85 percent chance of surviving leukemia if you're diagnosed early if you act on it if you heed the warning signs and go and talk to your doctor and if you get it early then everyone's got a fighting chance now that's going to bring us to the uh the work that you've done in this because i would assume and correct me if i'm wrong that that 85 percent odds of surviving it depends on where you live well very much so because you've got to have access to the treatment to stay alive you have to have the drugs that will keep you alive you know to, today i take oral chemotherapy uh, i take it every day to keep me alive i don't have to go to hospital for treatment like i've done for the last myriad years um so I, that, that's enabled me in the last three years to really go touring quite heavily whereas i couldn't do that leading up to 2015 really because i was uh, tied to a hospital regime every month i had to be in for you know chemotherapy or ret- um, maintenance treatments to keep me alive so you couldn't really disappear to america for three months on end like i've done the last couple of years so 
I, I'm lucky where I live, I have access to those treatments. But when in in um, when I was diagnosed for the second time in, in 2005, uh, I, I, I had an album by The Alarm coming out called Under Attack. And it, it was ironically titled before I knew I was I'd been diagnosed with leukemia. And um and, and I knew I couldn't get away from this one. I had to have the treatment, have to have the chemotherapy. I was in quite a bad way. And uh, I, the, I came uh, devised a plan of playing shows on once a month on a Saturday in between the chemotherapy treatments to keep promoting the record. And I thought, I'm going to play one gig in America. I'm going to try and get to South by Southwest to tell, tell America about the show in one place, uh, to, about the record. And um, it was in that on the journey there I met a guy called James Chippendale from Dallas Texas through a friend from Austin Texas and um, and James is a transplant survivor and he had leukemia a very aggressive form of leukemia acute myeloid leukemia and and he survived and had the transplant and my friend thought if I spoke to him he'd really be able to help me out and and, and James picked me up from the airport and uh, he took me to some of the meet the, the world's greatest specialists and they they looked at my situation and really concurred with my own doctor in Wales that I didn't need a transplant. The, 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 my own doctor thought that that was being more aggressive than the disease. And, and he thinks there's just, there was great things coming down the line. And the, the guys in Dallas told me that. And when I was with James in that situation, I realized his healthcare system in America was so different to mine. And there were people in America who didn't have access to the kind of tre basic treatments that I was given for free in the NHS, he, even James Chippendale, my friend who we co-founded Love, Hope, Strength together, he couldn't believe that my doctor in Wales was free and I didn't choose him from a list all around the country. And, uh, and, and how could you possibly trust that guy, you know? And, and it was by t only by talking to James that I was really then became aware of how health systems work differently in other countries. Because growing up in a healthcare system like you and I did in Britain, it, we, why you think the world gets the same treatment, don't you? And it's only then when you are it plunged into the into the realms of healthcare systems that you realise that there are others out there that just don't get the basics. And and that was really the driving force to create Love, Hope, Strength to give give other people the, the chance and the access to the kind of treatments that kept us alive. People who've gone through your situation in America can go bankrupt. Just just I, even. Even like even before getting through the treatment, I mean, they can die as cancer victims. There are people who have to make decisions on do they give up on treatment because they want to be able to leave something behind for their family. Like if I go bankrupt and I still die, then my family doesn't have a parent and they don't have any money. Whereas at least if I die, there might be a house left. I mean, we should not have to face those choices. Absolutely. And, it, and that that is obscene. But on, on another level of sort of obscenity is just the inequalities around the world and the fact that in a number of countries that, that you know, we throw around terms like third world and developing, but let's just say in a number of other countries that don't have um, the same kind of wealth as the USA and Europe, the similar, it's a different problem. There is no access because the healthcare just doesn't exist, even if you could afford it. Would that also be correct? Absolutely. That's, that's you know, when we... we we looked around the world, we could see that there were Africa, you know, countries in Africa that didn't have a, they didn't even have a cancer center. You know, we, we were, we would read the stories about Everest and, and read into thin air and realize that in, in Nepal, there was no basic treatment there. There was no, no specialists. And, and that was the trigger point for James and I, when we, when we started to realize that healthcare was different, um, James had done, had been a survivor a lot longer than I had. And, and, his, and through his treatment, he, he'd become aware of um, how much you can do uh, through the work, charitable works. And he'd worked for another charity and, uh, and wanted to really work on his own. He'd worked for an organization called the Ryan Gibson Organization, but he wanted to find his own way. And then when, when he met, I said, well, we can start a charity, you know, and, he, and we can call it Love, Hope, Strength. And, and, and James was... Um, a specialist in music and entertainment insurance. He wasn't on the stage side of things. He was behind the stage. Um, and and we, we, had, we were a good pairing so we could get, I could talk to musicians and he could talk to music executives. Um, and we, uh, I told him that I had this idea from when I was having chemotherapy in my hospital in Wales, I could see Mount Snowdon through the hospital window. And I, it was always a symbol to me. And I thought when, when I get well enough, 
that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to climb to the mountain, to the top of the mountain, as a symbol of me get, getting well. And I'm going to take all the alarm fans with me too. And James said, that's brilliant. And it probably because he's from Texas, that's great. But let's go to Everest and do it there as well. And it was like, OK. So it was, it was a crazy thought pattern. But we thought, yeah. And at first, it literally was James and I just picking up the phone and calling um, Sherpa in, in Kathmandu, saying, you, would you take us and a few musicians to Everest? And it was really basic. And, and then we were trying to get some sponsorship for the trek. And, uh, and some of the... Um, North American sponsors of the big, uh, you know, mountaineering clothing companies, shall we say. They would say, oh, we'd like to do that. But e everyone goes to Everest. Isn't there a mountain in America that you could climb? And I thought, well, let's let's climb the Empire State Building. That's like a mountain. And, and we, our first event as Love, Hope, Strength is climbing the Empire State Building up the stairs to do a concert on the summit. Oh, that's funny. That, that's really, really interesting because um, I don't think I don't know that it takes place anymore. There is a race that uh, used to go up um, the Empire State Building and also, um, you know, the Snowden area. Am I to take it from what you said that you had not climbed Snowden before uh, coming out of the hospital? No, I had I had climbed Snowden many times, but, but because I had I was so ill with the with the leukemia, what, what happened was I. I'd really dropped off the chart because I was in this watch and wait. I, I didn't, I was always on tour and I dropped out of some of the appointments. And after, after sort of four or five years of being looked into from 95 to say 2000, then life got busy again. I, the alarm got going again with Eddie and myself. And then it became just me carrying a flag. And, and, and I lost myself in that world for a number of years. And then, and then all of a sudden I started getting these, uh, I, I actually was was doing some shows and I don't drink on tour. And, and one night I was doing a gig and I was playing the gig with Captain Sensible from the Dam, Slim Jim Phantom from the Stray Cats. And, and, and they don't drink, but the crew did. And Kirk Brandon was there from Theatre of Hate. And, 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 um, and, and they said, look, Mike, you don't drink on tour. We, we don't, but come and have one beer with everybody tonight. You know, we know you like a beer now and again. So have a beer with doing two nights in the same venue. It's not going to kill you, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I went and had a beer with everybody. But when I woke up in the morning, I had the most in intense erection ever known to man. And I couldn't move. And I thought, I thought they, I actually thought they'd put Viagra in my beer. I thought that was the, and I remember staggering out to the tour bus, like going like this, you know, <laughs> trying, to, trying to hide it, you know, because it, it lasted for about five hours and it wouldn't go. It was embarrassing in your trousers, you know. And I really thought they'd done me. So I thought, I'm not going to say anything. Anyway, we got to the end of the tour and Jules came to the last night at Shepherd Bush Empire, had a couple of drinks after the show. And then it, it happened again the next morning. And Jules, I think, thought I'd been, you know, up, up to no good playing around. I had some sort of sexual disease and it was embarrassing. And then we went on our first holiday with our young son, Dylan. And it happened on the night, had a couple of drinks. And I thought, so I got back and I talked to, I called my doctor and he was nearby and he came to see me. And he, he's, he, once he examined me, he laid me down on the sofa and examined me. And he said, well, I was expecting this. He goes, I, I, all I know is what you're experiencing is called a priapism. That is what a, a, an, an extended erection is called. And, and he says, but I don't know what causes it. So he said, let me get back to the surgery. I'll make some calls and then we'll, we'll tackle this. And, so I went straight on the internet like you're not supposed to do. And I typed in the word priapism and one of the causes was leukemia. And I thought, that's got my name written all over it. And 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 off off the off the journey began. And that's that's really when when it, it got really scary for me then and uh and led me on this whole the whole scheme of things. Wow. Um Wow, I, 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 you know, I can understand why you might have thought somebody like Captain Sensible would have would have slipped Viagra in your drink. Like, come on, Mike, come out just for the one night, and it's be like, hey, we got him. But it's not, <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that, and it was infinite. But it, 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 it meant Seriously. that what what happened was really, really, I was so ill that when I went to to have to sit down with the doctor, my blood count, I I actually went for a chest X ray and give blood, and while I was waiting for the X ray, I had to give blood three or four times. I kept going back down to the hematology department to give blood. And it was only the next day when I sat down with the doctor, he said, look, the reason you were giving blood so much is that we couldn't read your blood count. It would not register on the machinery because instead of having a count in single figures, like a normal person 
you know, even four to, to 11, 11 is high, but four to five, six is, is normal. Well, I, my white count at the time registered at half, over half a million. It was that full of bad white blood. That's why we couldn't, I was getting these erections. I couldn't move. My arm was going stiff. And, and, and so that, while I was having, I had, to, had immediate chemotherapy treatment straight away. And, and it meant I couldn't climb anymore. I've always gone walking and running, hiking, but the chemo knocked me for sick. So it meant, I was determined to keep moving through chemo. I'd, have, I'd come home and I was, the doctor said, just rest for the day. And I'd go for a run, even if it was two miles, just to keep going. And, and I always knew that one day I'd have to go back to Snowden. That was my big thing. You know, climbing in the mountains was what I love. And I, yeah. I thought, that's where I'm going to go. Then I'll, when I get to the summit of Snowden, I'll know I'll reclaim my life back from cancer. You know, I, I've always loved going into the mountains because it, it is like you say, it's, you, there's peace there and, and, and harmony. And you can really find yourself in that silence as well. And, and then through the struggle, you do become stronger. You, you, you think you're, ne- you're not going to get there. Oh, this, this next cliff looks a bit hard, you know. And then when you've overcome it, you then, oh, wow, if I can do this one, I can do the next one. And it just, you get, you know, myself and my wife, Jules, ever since we've met, we've liked hiking in the mountains. And it's there that we've had our best times. We've had our best ever conversations. We've come, you know, we get really close. It's a really powerful um tool in our marriage to keep us strong and keep us united and keep us interested in each other and alive in each other because we go to the mountains and it's there that we we can discover our relationship without the distractions of the modern world which is assembled in the lowlands around the mountains when you get to the mountains there's no phone signal there's no internet no wi-fi you just left your own devices and, and the people that you're with and that's where your re- relationships can really blossom and your relationship with with earth and with 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 what planet earth has to offer yeah thank you for that i think you summarize that incredibly well and you know we've mentioned jules a little um watching those documentaries those documentaries so that you know what i'm talking about i've sent links to them privately one of them is called mike and jules while we still have time the other one is called jules my cancer journey they were both filmed by and broadcast on BBC Wales. You can find some info about them on the BBC iPlayer. I'm not sure they're readily available right now, but if you've seen them, I'm pretty certain you'll have come away with the same conclusions that I did. A, what a beautiful love story um, that you've had with her. I, I, I feel, always feel so happy for people who just found the love of their life and, and, and have made it work. You're 30 years married and, and, and ongoing, but B, as if you didn't go through enough, she went and got breast cancer as well and watching her journey. She's very intensely brave at uh, literally showing herself you know, naked for the cameras um, with the breast treatment and unbelievably brave to put herself on display like that for the television. Um, and God, God knows you guys didn't deserve that as well. And uh, I don't know why things can happen to the same family like that, but her bravery is astonishing. It really is. Oh yeah. I was, I was, I, you know, I, I knew Jules that, that I thought I knew her better than anyone in the world, but I didn't realize how many, or how deep the resolve would go when she was faced with her own situation, and it was, uh, you know, I think, it, I think Jules thinks um, when 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 we were diagnosed, when I was diagnosed, and we always think of it, we were both diagnosed because it's just, it's it's that's one thing people miss about cancer. When when someone's going through it, the whole family goes through it as well. You know, it's really tough on the carer as well as the, as the patient because sometimes. As the patient, you know what's happening. You know what's happening to your body and you know that you're going to get through tomorrow or you know you're going to struggle in 10 minutes. I need some help. But when you're the carer and you're just trying to put on a brave face, it's very difficult because you're living with all the fear all the time and the unknown. And so I, I always you know, like to give a shout out to the carers because they're very important in helping the patient get through the cancer journey. And, and, and I always thought, thank god i don't have to be a carer in my life and then all of a sudden jules got got smashed with breast cancer and but she was incredibly brave and, and made the made the caring uh, role much better for me and um but it was i was shocked because i'd not seen the kind of surgery and the devastation that happens to a woman and for anyone who has not seen those documentaries or has not lived personally and experienced breast cancer whether they're male or female 
The surgery and devastation Mike talks about really is quite brutal. And a certain medal of honor should go to Jules for the bravery she shows, not only in fighting the cancer itself, but in terms of putting herself on naked display like that, literally naked display for the cameras and also showing herself under the knife in the operating room. And for those who have seen the documentary, you may have found yourself asking, as I did, why were cameras there from the very first appointment? Was Mike kind of having his life turned into the Truman Show? Well, actually, here comes your answer. And to some extent, that is what was happening. When I was um, first diagnosed in 2005 and, and it became a public story, the BBC picked up on it and did a documentary called Road to Recovery. And then they, they were started doing a follow-up story on me because I had a relapse. And it was during the follow-up that, that Jules got diagnosed. And, and, and I think Jules always said it, it helped her in some way, having the cameras around, because it, it, it meant that she couldn't fall to the floor. You couldn't collapse in a heap because there was some, you know, a stranger there, the camera crew. And, it, and, it made, made, and she felt that it was a good opportunity, having experienced what I'd gone through and, and, and all the disinformation that's out there about it and the, 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 the people don't realise what's going to happen for carers and for patients. So it was a good opportunity to show the, the, what happens in, in real time because a lot of people's cancer stories are told after they've been diagnosed, whereas Jules was literally diagnosed on camera and it went from there. So it was, uh, she knew she had a, a great opportunity to show the story. And, and it's, it's been a massive resource, that, that, that Jules' documentary. And she every week she has a mentoring session with... with uh, all hosts of women who, who made contact with her through being breast cancer and having that in common. So she, her, her work continues all the time through that. And it's, it's amazing. Her. And I think, again, we're, we're both quite, we're all both committed people to life as it is. But, we're, but we're, now we've been touched by cancer, we're committed to helping other people get through it as well. Give me love. Give me love. In terms of um, what you've been able to achieve with Love, Hope, Strength, and am I, am I right the title of the foundation comes from sort of the Strength album and song, which would have been, I guess, the second alarm album, and that would have been the one you were probably promoting back in 86 when I came to correct, the States? Yeah. Absolutely, Tony. That was really where it started. Um, we had the, um, the song Strength, had Give Me Love, Give Me Hope, Give Me Strength, but also in, in that album, the, the, the words love, hope and strength appeared in about six of the songs. They're in D side. They were in walk forever by my side. They were in dawn chorus. And when I was looking through the lyrics and for an album title, the strength came up, but it could easily have been love, hope, strength, but we just we were in the, I was trying to find one word album titles. And, and then when, um, when I was diagnosed for the second time and going into hospital, I, I decided to make some love, hope, strength, t-shirts to wear, in, in hospital and, and give to my friends and family so they could wear them with, they were in green and they had love, hope, strength. And I thought, it just focused our minds when we, when we see each other, that's what we're going to read. And they're the three words that are going to be implanted in our mindset to help us through this. And, and it was um, James Chippendale who saw the t-shirts and said, that, that, we've got to start a charity. It's got to be called love, hope, strength. I thought, yeah, that's it. So you, you did these kind of, um, uh, climbs, you know, you start with uh, personally getting back to Snowden, then you do the Empire State Building, and then you set your sights on Everest. And uh, with the time we have left, I really want to talk about some of these outdoor things, and then and then what you've been able to do with the charity, found the charity slash foundation. Um, is the goal of doing these kind of climbs? Is it both to raise, or you can raise awareness and money at the same time? Is that how how these things Absolutely. really work? Yeah, absolutely. Because when, when James and I met, we, we realized that we we were both survivors. We represented the new face of cancer where it is not a death sentence all the time. And we felt that we we could put that message out by going to Everest. It was unusual to, for musicians to go there, try and do the highest gig on the earth at the time. We knew that would get us some headlines in the newspapers. And through that, we'd have the opportunity to tell our story that we're survivors and that if you uh, react like we did when we heard the word cancer applied to our lives, go, don't be afraid to go to the doctors. Don't be afraid to 
talk about it, then you might save your own lives. And, and then that was really where our journey started. And that's when we thought going to Everest, taking as many musicians as we could, would amplify that message. But we were also acutely aware that on the ground, we could do a lot of support. When Mike was first receiving chemotherapy treatment in a hospital in North Wales, it was right before Christmas, and the first person to receive a transplant in Wales was in there. Mike asked him why, and he was told it's because the guy does a lot of fundraising and likes to make sure the money goes straight to the source and doesn't get siphoned off by perhaps well-meaning but uh, uh, admin-ridden charities in the interim. And that was an example that Mike drew from when he set up Love, Hope, Strength. And, and, and that was really the aim. When we, when we went to Everest, we, we applied the same. When I was, we did on Snowden, whereas we, we, we contacted the hospitals on the ground and said, we're going to raise the money and we're going to give it to you. And it's not going to go through a, 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 you know, an aid um, charity in a global organisation. It's going to come direct from our hand to you guys and you, you use it how you see fit. And when we went to Everest, we, we hooked up with a, uh, the Back to Poor Cancer Centre in Kathmandu and it was a very basic unit with um, one man Dr Baral who had a vision to try and bring cancer care to Nepal and he needed a mammography machine so that breast cancer patients in Nepal wouldn't have to fly to India to be checked and they could stay close to their families to be checked and then treated so we said look we, we're going to climb Everest and we're going to raise funds to buy you a mammography machine and that's what we did you know, people resonated with the story. They saw Glenn Tilbrook singing on the mountain, Slim Jim playing drums. He was like the Fonz on, on Everest, you know. No one would have a phone signal, but Slim Jim, hey, darling, how's it going? You know, his, his would always work. And, it, um, and all these stories came out. Um, and then when we took everybody with the cameras, because we had VH1 uh, agreed to uh, edit the footage we were making on the film, that, that which gave us a powerful voice into America, when we took people into the cancer centres in in these countries, people were shocked, you know, because we'd all got used to the National Health Service or insurance in healthcare systems in America, but uh, it was still shocking to see people with nothing. And or the only way they could care for each other was almost by holding hands and yeah. praying. They had no treatment. So it made a big impact. So I've um, been to Nepal myself in 2016 when we did our... Uh... Uh, backpacking around the world we spent about a month there and we hiked uh, the Annapurna base camp a an incredibly beautiful meditative experience um, Nepal you, you know such a beautiful country obviously it's got the world's tallest mountains there but for all of that and for all that there is something to be said for a, a, you know, a country that still you know is relatively rural my god it's poor and and it's poor in the sense of the, the rural population I mean, there's almost, it's almost the barter system. There's kind of like no money. And so I was watching, you raised $600,000 for that um, hospital there. That's, that's right, yeah. In Nepal, that's, that's tens of millions of dollars. Yeah, it was, it was phenomenal. And, we, and we've gone back to Everest twice. You know, we, we did a second trip with, um, with other musicians like um, Robin Wilson from Jim Blossoms and, and, um, and G Love from Hot Special Sauce and, and, and um, other other artists and it was it was powerful to support carry on support in we still twin with um, the back to Cork center now we've been uh, we've just got projects on the go that we've been supporting them just recently and, and even when the the massive earthquake happened and devastated um places like view bar square which we performed in uh and, and so it's got a special place we actually linked up with um with linkin park they've got um uh, a charity that's more of a disaster fund uh, charity um, and, and we, we actually raised between us all we raised a quarter of a million dollars to, to support people in, in their time of need after the earthquake. You can hear more about Nepal on episode nine of One Step Beyond when we featured Manu Preshna who is a success story from House with Heart, a children's home for uh, orphaned and homeless children that was started by a sort of coincidence by a British woman called Beverly Bronson, who was living in New York City, married or at least the partner of one of the members of Simple Minds, a band that often falls into the same conversations as The Alarm, and who very, very sadly two years ago passed away from cancer herself. Uh, Manu 
The student is now studying in the United States to become a nurse and plans to take that degree back to Nepal where she can apply it to her home country, which has the barest bones of a healthcare system. It had to lock down for almost the whole of 2020 uh, because it would not have been able to cope with a COVID outbreak. And by another bizarre coincidence that seems to fit, this particular episode, there has been a serious COVID outbreak at base camp on Everest, and it has called into question the nature, if you'll excuse that pun, of the climbing season being ongoing in a country that borders India, which is going through such devastation itself right now. As ever, all these things connect. But one of the connections you'll find is that when you go to Nepal, you're completely overwhelmed, not just by the beauty of the natural surroundings and the history, but by the people themselves. That's what happens when you go to Nepal. You might go to climb Everest to support the Back to Nepal Cancer Centre. Um, um, but uh, when you arrive, you're just one of an, a whole lot of backpackers. And then once the, once the Sherpa started seeing that we were carrying guitars up the mountain, they're going, what's, what's going on? And when, when we told them that the money we were raising was going to stay in Nepal, well, they couldn't do enough for us. You know, we, we did a, a, a gig in, in Namche Bazaar and, and all these people came over the mountain to climb and they were climbing in through the roof to watch the gig. And it was, it, you know, we just fell in love with everybody. And when we came home, we all knew we left some of our soul behind there. And, and uh, we're already planning to go back again in maybe 2027 for the 20th anniversary and, and, uh, and see how far uh, the, the centre's come since we started supporting it, because they've come a long way. I want to be clear, of course, you didn't perform on the top of Mount Everest. It was Everest Base Camp, <laughs> which, is, which is high enough. What's the altitude of Everest Base Camp? I think it was 18,500 feet. Right. We, and we, we actually played on the, on the top of, um, of Kalapatar, in, in, uh, just above Base Camp. And it was, um, it was about another 1,000 feet higher than Base Camp itself. So it was... Uh, it was a tough challenge to get up that last day. Well, but it it's, was, it's uh, a hell of a challenge at that altitude. And the only reason I know is because I've been to the top of Kilimanjaro. As listeners are probably really bored of hearing me say, how did you cope with that? And, and in terms of going there, where did you perform on Kilimanjaro? Well, we, we, we went up the Lamosho route. So we, we took a long time to get there. Um, and we, we um, our pre-summit uh, evening was spent at the... Um, the glacier campsite so when we when we set off at, in at four in the morning to, to get to the summit it wasn't the the sort of brutal day that it has for a lot of people coming up the other side and coming up the volcanic ash and it's like climbing a massive sand hill for hours and hours on end so we, we had a an easier attack to the summit but it was still tough um, and we when we played on the summit obviously you can't sing for very long because you you lose all your breath so that's why whenever we've gone on a Love Help Strength mountain trek, we've always taken a group of five or six singers so we can pass the song along. And when one's dying, the other one picks it up. You know, it's a, it's a proper team effort up there. These are two countries we've both been to. Tanzania, beautiful country, beautiful people, lots and lots of tourism because of Kilimanjaro and the safaris, the Serengeti, etc. Again, devastatingly poor. So what were you able to do in Tanzania? We, we were able to help build um, a children's cancer centre in Dar es Salaam. Uh, that was where we our funds on Kilimanjaro. Well, we've done again. We've done two tre uh, treks to Kilimanjaro, and, and we've continued to support. Uh, we, we, we've helped. Uh, it's it's part of the Ocean Road Institution. Uh, is the main hospital, and but they really have no um, facility for children's cancer. So we helped fund uh, the, the, the building of a children's cancer centre there and, and the wards are, are named in Swahili after Love, Hope and Strength. It's a beautiful place. I've been a couple of times. I went to open the centre because, again, the money we were raising in the West, when, when, you, when you take it back to spend completely in, in Africa, it goes far further than you're trying to build a centre in London or New York or somewhere. And to that end, just as the concert at Everest Base Camp was not the end of fundraising for the Mammography Center in Nepal, neither was the concert atop of Kilimanjaro the end of the fundraising for the Cancer Center in Tanzania. 
just recently uh, we did a big night in um, our sort of online show through the alarm.com through love hope strength .co.uk, our websites we did a big love hope strength broadcast night um, and we've just donated another forty thousand pounds into um Dar es Salaam to, to help the the center grow as a, a and and help them find staff and and training for the facilities they've got down there i know that you've done some other treks i know we're also running out of time i think mount fuji you did a concert there um if you had to highlight one other um thing that you've been able to achieve either either through a great sort of you know uh, event or just through something on the ground that you're really proud of the uh the, the foundation achieving what would it be well partly why we went to a place like uh, Mount Fuji, like you mentioned in, in Japan, was, you know, Japan's got a fantastic cancer care system. But we thought if we went there we, and we did a concert on, on the summit of Mount Fuji as the sun was coming up, the land of the rising sun, it would, again, it would help us create awareness for the other side of what we do, which is bone marrow donation. We, we try to get the message out there that, that uh, having a bone marrow transplant in this day and age is not what it used to be. A bone marrow transplant in this day and age is an outpatient procedure for the donor. So it's, it's almost like giving blood. So it's very simple, but people didn't realize it. So we started a campaign called Get On The List, where we were encouraging people to become bone marrow donors. And we started doing a Get On The List campaign at music festivals in the UK, like Isle of Wight. We, we worked at Lollapalooza, Austin City Limits, Riot Fest, Outside Lands in San Francisco. And we partnered with those festivals uh, and run get on the list campaigns to have their audience register to become bone marrow donors. And, and we set up these get on the list booths in the festival sites. And so through that work, we were able to register over 250,000 donors. And we've also subsequently found over four and a half thousand potentially life-saving matches for individuals who need a bone marrow transplant that's not from someone within their family. And given that you can't do this with gigs at the moment, I know we're hopeful that concerts are coming back. How can somebody uh, listening to this sign up and you know, get on the list right now? Yeah, if they come to lovehopestrength.co.uk or if in America, lovehopestrength.org, there's a simple button to press on there and we'll send you a, a swab kit in the post. You can do it at home, send it back to us and we can put you on the registry and hopefully you'll be somebody who comes on to save somebody's life. A necessary caveat, you do have to be 55 years or younger to be able to register. How do I know this? Well, let's just say I went on the website and went to get on the list. But anyway, in setting up his own Get On The List campaign, Mike heard about an initiative taking place in another part of the world that is on the front pages of all the newspapers today, top of the news stories and broadcasts for all the wrong but familiar reasons, which makes the initiative all the more pertinent, positive and hopefully powerful and peaceful. When we started the campaign, I, I read about um, a lady in, in Israel called Dr. Amal Bashara and she was doing bone marrow drives in um, in Israeli Arab 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 villages. And what was happening was that, that, that people from Palestine were heard about this, and they were coming sneaking across the border at night because they had cancer in their families, and asking her to register um, Palestinians to the bone marrow registry. And then, um, and as a result, Palestinians were, were were getting on the list, not not just saving the lives of Palestinians, they were saving the lives of Jewish people on the and so she and vice versa. She was signing Jewish people up who were then having to be asked to save the lives of Palestinian, and she was building really amazing bridges of hope in in the Middle East. And we were able to support her campaign by creating the what we call the world's longest ever song. And we created a song called The Scriptures that lasted for something like 96 minutes. And we had people from all over the world contributing lyrics and playing guitar and singing on it. And uh, um, it's the same song for 90 minutes in, done in a million different arrangement styles. And, uh, but through that, we were able to support the campaign and, uh, and keep the um, initiative alive there, which, which has resulted in some incredible life-saving stories. We always say potentially because... The procedure is anonymous. It's, o it's only really if the recipient wants to open that door and meet the donor in the future life. And some people don't want that responsibility. And sometimes the donor doesn't make it. So, so it, we don't want to upset the, 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 you know, the situation, really. So everyone 
we say potentially life-saving because we, we keep the outcomes can be decided between the donor and the recipient rather than a prerequisite before the procedure starts. Right. And that also brings us full circle to the fact that for all these incredible developments in science uh, and medicine, that we don't bat 100%. Um, you know, there, there are, there are going to be people that don't make it. There are going to be valiant attempts and transplants and fighting cancers and leukemias, but not everybody is going to make it through the other side. We're just increasing the odds. It's like you said, we went from 85 against to 85 for with leukemia. That's right. And look, what we're trying to put across with Love, Hope, Strength is that, that, that life is, is precious. Just having 10 more minutes is, is a gift. And, and, and sometimes in the passing through cancer, life can reveal itself to be incredibly beautiful. And, and they're the moments to strive for. If you can find love, hope, strength in yourself to stay alive for one more day, to tell your wife, I love you one more time, or hold your child's hand, that's worth a million pounds. That's worth a, a lot of money, a lot of time, you know, you can't, and it's worth it. And so I always say to everybody, if you, if you have the right mindset with cancer, you can always beat it. You, you might not outrun it fully, but you might be able to get one more yard out of the journey that you didn't know you had in you. And that in that one yard is a lot of beauty. And in that one final quotation, there is a lot of poetry. I want to thank Mike for taking time out to talk with me, not just catching up as old friends, but to discuss his life journey over this last quarter century and all the good that has come from it. You can find Love Hope Strength at lovehopestrength.org or lovehopestrength.co.uk, depending on where you're living. And when you do so, you will see right up top of the front page about a sponsored walk that Mike is taking over the coming weeks, the Offers Dyke Virtual Hike. It's something he would like to have done with people around him. There will be a handful of people. And because I am about to leave for the UK straight after producing this episode, I am hoping I might be able to join Mike and Jules and co for just a little bit of that surely beautiful hike. And if I do, I'll bring my trusty tape recorder with me, actually digital recorder, of course, and use whatever we have for a future episode. Of course, I also encourage you to visit Mike at thealarm.com where you'll get all the updates on his never-ending musical activities. And I suspect the show notes this time around are going to be especially busy with links. Because this interview ran long, I'm going to eschew my usual catch-up on my own outdoor activities as they pertain to this show. That's actually the second episode in a row. Some of you may be relieved. Some of you may actually miss it. Let me know via social media or via the means that you're about to hear in the credits. One Step Beyond is written, produced and narrated by Tony Fletcher. Incidental music is by Noel Fletcher, unless otherwise stated. The theme song is by Madness, used with permission... And the logo is by Mark Lerner. Special thanks to Radio Kingston for airing these episodes and for supplying studio space when not under lockdown. If you like what you hear, please consider throwing us a tip via the Support This Show button on your phone or by visiting supporter.acast.com slash one step beyond lowercase. You can also hit the subscribe button and or leave a positive rating and or review. It all helps. One Step Beyond is on social media, mainly on Instagram. Just search One Step Beyond with Tony Fletcher there or on Facebook and Twitter and we should come up straight away. To subscribe to a newsletter, to reach out via email and especially if you're interested in sponsorship opportunities, the address is onestepbeyond at ijamming.net. One Step Beyond is available on just about every podcast platform known to man and most likely a few that have yet to be discovered. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay active. <laughs>